Please open your Bibles to the New Testament book of John. As we continue to study in that book, we'll look at chapter 5, verses 37 through 40. But before we do, that's Matthew 5, 37 through 40. I want to read to you a familiar passage from Matthew chapter 7 as part of the Sermon on the Mount. In verse 21, beginning, Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Then he gives us a picture of judgment. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now the reason I read that is because the picture the Lord gives there, the judgment, are people who acknowledge him as Lord and who claim to have been doing all these things in his name, as he wanted them to do them. But the Lord says, I don't know you, and I never have known you. Depart from me. So this is not talking about the atheist or some sort of infidel. These people have been persuaded that Jesus Christ is Lord. And they, along with everybody else on the day of judgment, are now before him to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. And they make that statement, and he says, no, I never knew you. Now, I want you to hold that in mind, because we're not talking about here atheists, are we? They acknowledge him as Lord. And they even said they worked for him on earth. They were faithful to him, and the Lord said you didn't. No matter what you think you did, you didn't. And I don't know you. Now to our passage in John, and we'll come back and make mention of what we just read Matthew 7 a moment ago. The all-sufficiency of the Scriptures is certainly an important doctrine, and around here we emphasize it very much. And we, qu we quote, as we did this morning, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, in like passages, teaching us that God's revealed His will in His Word and that it's for our instruction in righteousness that we might be complete before Him. In fact, Peter says it this way, that He has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, 2 Peter 1.3. You don't need to go outside the knowledge of the Bible to learn about life and godliness and how you can have spiritual life and not have it. So no further revelation from God's needed. As Jude said, the faith has been once for all delivered to the saints, Jude verse 3. American Standard Version says once for all. There's no latter-day revelation since the hand of inspiration laid down the pen of inspiration before the first century was over. There's been no new revelation from God. Somebody says, well, I had one. No, you didn't. I'm reminded of what Brother Wallace said one time when he was in East Arkansas. Got up Sunday morning and was staying not too far from the building, so he decided he'd walk down as they began the meeting that he was in. So as he walked down the street, so the guy came up to him and uh, said, are you saved? Brother Wallace said, certainly, I'm saved. He said, well, I didn't know what to say, which most of the time that happens, according to Brother Wallace. He said, well, the Holy Spirit told me to come over here and ask you that. Brother Wallace said, look, the Holy Spirit knows I'm saved because I was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He said, there must be some other ghost after you. And that's exactly right. If you're following something, that is foreign to the teaching of the New Testament, some other ghost is after you. And there's not but one other spirit being who seeks your demise every split second of every day. And Peter talked about him too. The devil, Satan, is a roaring lion, goeth about seeking whom he may devour. 
And I guarantee you, he doesn't go to sleep on the job. So we have that which is able in the Word of God to build us up spiritually and give us an inheritance that is assure us of going to heaven. Acts 20 and verse 32, as Paul said as much to the Ephesian elders. Now, having said all of that about the sufficiency of the Scriptures and keeping in mind what we read in Matthew 7, there is a time when the Scriptures are not enough. When regardless of the Scripture's power to save us from sin, that is the Word of God's power to save us from sin, it can't save us. No matter how diligently one may study it, that is the Word of God, they get no benefit from it spiritually. So there can be a time when the Scriptures alone are not enough. Now, we find such an occasion in the passage in John 5, 37 through 40. And here's a gospel account, John's gospel account. Now let's read it, beginning in verse 37. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, Jesus says, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent him ye believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. I want to study that, and you'll see what I'm talking about when the scriptures are not enough. These are unbelieving Jews. Now, they've only had 1,500 years of instruction from the law of Moses to get ready for the Messiah. And they don't believe he's the Messiah. If you look at verses 16 through 18, John chapter 5, we talked about some of that last week. You can see how they felt about him. They wanted to kill him. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So they rejected various sources that truly bore witness to Jesus that he was the Son of God. You can see that in 33 through 36. You sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. That's John the baptizer, the forerunner of the Christ. But I receive not testimony from man. But these things I say, that ye might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light. And ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. Now listen, but I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father hath sent me. Now in John 5, 37 through 40, which we've already read, that's our text, we learn in one sense when and how the scriptures alone are not enough as it proved in this case of the Jews. Now let's search and see why that's the case. First of all, they diligently search the scriptures. Verse 39, we've already read, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. Now there's a bit of... Uh, difference in translation between the KJV, the King James Version, and the New King James Version, as well as uh, the American Standard Version, 1901. And it's a matter of grammar as to whether the grammar in the Greek is one way or it's another way. And I'm not going to go into that except to read this. Robertson's word pictures gives us this comment. 
about verse 39. The form here can either be present, active, indicative, second person, plural. As you see why I'm not going to go into this detail. Or the present, active, imperative, second person, plural. So this shows if you knew Greek like Paul knew it and could write it like he wrote it, notice it's context that makes the difference. I often say to people, I don't care if you know Greek, what is Paul? Well, you still have to follow the rules of interpretation. You still, you, I asked some group one time, talking about studying Greek and the importance of it, I said, I don't doubt it. I said, it's an important matter. I'm glad we have people that can render into English to the Greek. But I said, ever dawn on anybody that all this false doctrine that led to the departure from the faith was all done by Greek speaking and writing people? So it must be something more than Greek that one needs in order to ascertain the truth and abide in it. Well, either one, whether it's an imper imperative, which means it must, it has to be, you can't get around it, second person plural, or whether it's an indicative second person plural. It still teaches you've got to search the Scriptures if you're going to know God's will. Now, it is imperative, whether this is it or not, that we study the Scriptures. It also can be indicative in that it's obvious that you know your scriptures and you couldn't know it if you didn't study it. So, either way makes sense. But the reason given, notice, because ye think. Now, that's clearly indicative. That indicates because ye think. Supports then the indicative rather than the imperative, but the truth comes out either way you go. But the translators of the Greek and their scholarly knowledge of Greek and English one rendered it one way and then others rendered it another way. It doesn't change the truth. What is it? Without the scriptures, you can't know God's will. And other passages teach you must study the scriptures. And other passages reveal by what you know indicates you have studied the scriptures. But anyway, that's why if you have a new King James, it's going to read a little different here than King James or if you're reading the American Standard Version. The point being, the Jews were diligent studies, students of the Scriptures. Moses, according to Acts 15, 21, was read in the synagogues every Sabbath. I think it's interesting to find this from, at least I thought it was, McGarvey's fourfold gospel. Here's what J.W. McGarvey said well over a century ago in his fourfold gospel. Hillel, which was one of the great rabbis of a foregone day before the first century, he says, Hillel used to say, and then he quotes, more law, more life. He who has gotten himself words of law has gotten himself the life of the world to come. It's found in the Talmud, which is a collection of all these rabbis for years. Now notice, I'm talking about when the scriptures are not enough. And here's an example of it in John 5. In their zeal for the Scriptures, the Jews have been so careful is that they counted every letter of them, expecting to find life in the laws and precepts. In fact, if you were a scribe, as we read of them in the New Testament, you were so careful about making sure this is exactly what it says that if you had a whole page translated and you got down here to the bottom and you missed one letter or if you were just copying it from Hebrew to Hebrew and you missed one letter, you threw away the whole thing started over again. That, of course, worked very well for the preservation of the Scriptures and to see how astute and particular and specific and detailed a Jewish scribe was when it came to the Scriptures. But it also shows here you can be that meticulous and not learn the truth. How many Bibles in the United States? And back in the 19th century, when people read it a lot more and knew it a lot better and realized it's God's Word, why were there so many people as there are today, or there's even more today, who did not believe in following? <laughs> hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of volumes of the Bible. Greek scholars already done us a big favor 
as well as Hebrew scholars, and put it in English so we can read it. And we were talking earlier, Connie was mentioning a person she knew. I think you'd say, Connie, she's very religious, but didn't know anything about the Bible. I suggest if you want to run a survey, you just try that on the people around about us and all these churches, and even many members of the Lord's Church now, if you call them that, and you'll see just how biblically ignorant people are as to why they believe what they believe, or even how to ascertain the authority of the Lord and how faith in a person in God is formed. So I dare say few could be more careful and diligent in their study of the Scriptures than were those Jews. And the Jews Jesus is talking to certainly would have considered themselves that way. But the Scriptures did not benefit them. Why? First of all, they were simply unwilling to believe in Him of whom the Scriptures testified Make a difference about the evidence. Make a difference about their full understanding of what was said. It didn't suit their purposes. They didn't accept what was said. They would not see in Jesus the fulfillment of all these prophecies. And failing to believe in Jesus led to the Father's word not abiding in them. That's what Jesus said, John 5, 38. Thus their unwillingness to believe in him of whom the scriptures testified, then the scriptures failed to be the word of life for them. In other words, it takes more than just the written word and my understanding of it. It's not going to just whack me upside the head until I believe. <laughs> see, the Lord wants to see it's something on our part. That's the way it's all set up like it is. We're made like we are, and the will of heaven is presented to us like it is so that I will have an opportunity to either say, I will do what I understand, or I will not. And if I will not, it's not going to benefit me. It's a closed book to me. The Word of God's no good to me. And that's how it is that such is the case. So their unwillingness to believe in Him, as the Scriptures had given testimony, caused them to not have the Word of life in them. Now just think, many Jews, and as a race, all of them, had the benefit, as Paul said, of receiving the oracles of God, Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And they diligently studied them, but it didn't benefit them. They did not have the attitude that says, I will submit no matter the sacrifice to what I learn from this book, no matter how much it goes against my preconceived notions. And the Word of God is no good to you. It's insufficient when that's your attitude. So God's put it in me to block His efforts to save me. He's put it in me to block the message of truth by my will. We only knew how strong our wills are. You know, God could speak nothing to nothing and it produced something. That's the power of His Word. That there be light, and there was light. Hebrew is light be, light was. But He can say, be saved. And I say, no. No, I know what the Word said. But I don't believe you have to be baptized to be saved. And what good is it to you then? None whatsoever. That's what the Jews did concerning Jesus. And yet they were diligent students of the Scriptures. But other things hindered them from taking these truths and applying them. So how many students of the Word today are walking in the footsteps of those Jews of long, long ago? So we ask the question, how can the Scriptures fail to be enough for us today? And I think we already see some of that. We have seen that people may be diligent students of the Scriptures. Indeed, we not only should, but must be diligent students of the Word of God. We can give you several reasons why we should. The gospel is God's power to save us uh, from sin, Romans 1.16. That's one reason. God's Word is living and powerful, Hebrews 4.12. God's Word can save our souls, James 1.21. God's Word can make one born again, 1 Peter 1, verse 22. 
God's Word can help us grow spiritually, 1 Peter 2 and verse 2. And the Word can give us that inheritance among all those who are sanctified, Acts 20 and verse 32. Like the Jews of our Lord's time on earth, today many people are diligent students of the Word. Uh, the denominations have their scholars, and they are scholarly in the knowledge of the Hebrew language and the history and the Greek and all sorts of other things that mark a scholar. Now, why are they saved? Many of them having THDs and PhDs, and they've studied all over the place and written commentaries. Why aren't they saved? They spend lots and lots of time in the book. And they end up simply, as Paul said of folks of some of his day, and so to the end of time, ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why is that the case? Does God want to be saved? Yeah, he'd have everybody saved. Jesus came to save everybody. He came to seek and save that was law. He's the great physician. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But notice, there it is. You must want to come to Him, and you come to Him on His terms. Now, where have His terms laid out in the Word? I can know them and say, that doesn't mean what it says. I can read it and say, yes, I understand the meaning of the Word. I, I don't believe they'd do that. There's where the problem is. You can have Peter saying all day long, baptism doth also now save us, and there'll be hundreds of people say, I don't believe you have to be baptized to be saved. Now when you see that, that's what the Jews were doing to Jesus and saying we don't believe him. All this evidence that came out in his life that said, yes, I'm the Messiah, fulfillment of prophecies, miracles that were done, all those things, they said, nope. That's not what we think you ought to be like. <laughs> Sad. And so many people continue to read the Bible daily and they study it in the various churches frequently. Some can quote scriptures and quote quite a bit of it. And there are church members who are like the noble Berean Jews in the study of the scriptures, Acts 17, 11, and they're going to stand before the Lord in judgment and they're going to say all those things. They're going to acknowledge Him being Lord. And they're going to say, didn't we do all these things in thy name? He said, I don't know you. I don't know you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Work iniquity? That means you're going contrary to what the Word says. That's what you've been doing. No, we, we did this in thy name. Lord, no, you didn't. Now, reckon who wins the argument. Sadly, the Scriptures will not benefit most of people around us. That's so sad. I don't want to be a part of that, do you? Because... Straight is the gate, and narrow way is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Because wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. And a lot of them are not just atheists and agnostics and Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims, or denominational people. Some of them are members of the church. Because they study the Bible, but when they run up against something that condemns whatever actions they're doing or the failure to do something, they just sort of bowl their neck. And maybe the more I bowl, the more I'll finally get him to let me <laughs> accept myself as I am and not do what he said. You know, faith comes by hearing the Word of God. But Hebrews 4, 1 and 2 says of the people following the law of Moses or under the law of Moses wandering in the wilderness. Here's what it says about that. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them. Why? It's the word of God. It was given to direct them, to lead them, to show them what they needed. Here's why. Not being mixed with faith in them or those who heard it. Again, Hebrews 4, 1 and 2. Why is that in your Bible? Now, there's part of the scriptures. Read it. What do you understand? It says, if you take the attitude of those folks that fell in the wilderness then you're going to fall too. They had the living oracles delivered to them. They even saw the man through whom the law of Moses was given, Moses himself. 
And look how they died in the wilderness because of unbelief. And the writer of Hebrews says that can happen to you. You can have the word, but it will not profit you. So like the Israelites who fell in the wilderness, we may come short of our promised rest. That's why we're taught to examine yourself to see whether you be in the faith. These folks in Matthew 7, their judgment, well, they said, we've done all this. We're on your side. Can't you see that, Lord? Well, if we're not doers of the word, and that's where we're headed on all this. If we're not obedient to the truth. If we don't carry out the Lord's will for us in our lives by submitting to Him. If we're only hearers, then we're deceiving ourselves. Now, James wrote that to Christians. He didn't write to people outside of Christ. James chapter 1, verses 21 and 25. That means that once I become a Christian, I can still commit the same sin. Because remember, these Jews Jesus is dealing with were in a covenant relationship with God. But they didn't even accept Jesus, their Savior, whom they had looked for because it was not as they thought it ought to be. If we're only hearers, we will not stand in times of trial. Matthew 7, 24, 27. And that's what happens. When you look at our Lord's teaching in Luke 8 concerning what we call the parable of the soils, is what I call it, the, each soil represents a different disposition or attitude of heart. And there's only one of them, Luke verse 8, 15, that says honest and good heart. That's the only kind of heart that's going to receive the word, bring forth fruit. The others all receive the same word. Have you ever noticed that? They all receive the same word. But well, it didn't profit them. Why? Because the word all by itself, no matter how well understood, will not save you if you don't submit to it. Thus, he's the author of eternal salvation and do all of them that give lip service to the Bible. <laughs> to all them that obey Him. Hebrews 5, 9. So unless we believe and obey the Word, it cannot save us and it's insufficient if that's the way we view it. So you see how I'm saying in a sense it's not sufficient alone. The Word of God is truly all sufficient to do the work God designed it to do. Remember last week, I think it was last week, I referred to Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 through 11, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. But it shall accomplish that or what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. It wasn't doing those Jews any good back in Jesus' day. Well, that tells me something about the Word. Old Pharaoh saw every sign, a miracle, that said what Moses is telling you about the children of Israel is God's will. Every plague in Egypt was against the God of Egypt. And if he had had an honest heart, Luke 8, 15, he would have said, I see this is the only God that's telling uh, me to let uh, these people go. And he would have cooperated with God in submission to the statement of Moses. Let my people go. But he didn't, and the scripture says that his heart was hardened, that he hardened his heart, and it says God hardened his heart. What? You mean God made it impossible with this man, no matter how much you wanted to be saved and compliant with God's will, that he wouldn't? No. It just tells you that if you don't want to obey the word, that's how you harden your heart. That's exactly what it is. When you know that this is aimed at you, remember the old draft poster in World War II? Uncle Sam saying, I want you. Of course, everybody looked at it, it was you. None of it's any good if you don't want it to be you. We're to bear fruit. But it can only do it in a good and honest heart, a noble heart, Luke 8, 11, and 15. Yet the people of the book, now that's what the Koran calls Jews and Christians, need to take heed, the people of the book. That's not a bad way to refer to Christians, the people of the book. I like it. 
I could agree with him on that. The word cannot bear fruit in some hearts. That's clear from what I said a moment ago in Luke 8, 12 through 14. It can't do it. It just can't do it. We must let the word lead us to him who is the giver of life. You see that in verse 40, John 5. And indeed, the all-sufficiency of the Word must be understood in its context. But now here's what, if we don't watch out, we'll think. The Word alone can save me. No, it can't. The Word alone cannot save you if you don't love God and keep His commandments. The Word alone can't save you if you don't have faith in God built upon it, thus saith the Lord proposition. You can't do it. To be saved, then, we need faith, John 8, 24. We need the blood of Christ, Ephesians 1, 7. Yeah, we even need water, Ephesians 5, 26. And that last, uh, that last statement of Paul to the Ephesians is an allusion to water baptism. By the way, water baptism, where the Word, God's grace, Christ's blood, and our faith comes together to provide the remission of sins. Isn't that interesting? Acts 2, 38 and 22, 16. So, to one who's received the word, believed in Christ, repented of sins, and now why tarryest thou? Rise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. To call on the name of the Lord is to appeal to his authority. To appeal to his authority is to go by his word. To submit to his word is the only way you appeal to his authority, or do you any good. So, the scriptures alone are not enough. If you don't let them form faith in you, of faith that's obedient. If you study the Bible for all sorts of reasons other than to learn your Lord's will, that you can discharge your obligations to Him, will work. So when you study the Bible, what is the motive in your mind for studying that book? Is it to learn and do the will of God? So when we're working on ourselves, We've got to always be thinking, am I really warning this? Sometimes we pray, oh, Father, help me see what I need to see to better myself in Christ. You sure you want to answer the answer to that prayer? <laughs> well, yes, we do, but sometimes what comes at us is what we're unprepared for. It may be something I just don't want to change. If that's the case, what good the Word do you? Not one bit of good. So there must be the compliant disposition, honest heart that will receive with meekness the engrafted word because it's able to save your soul. It doesn't say it will, but it's able to. But it's only able to save the soul of the person that will follow what it teaches and submit to it, Hebrews 5, 9. If you're not a Christian, we urge you to become one this evening. A Christian like you read of in your own New Testament. If as a child of God you sinned, we certainly urge you to be humble. Follow the teaching of the Bible and God's second law of pardon for the child of God to repent of sins and confess them and pray God for forgiveness. Therefore, if you're subject to the invitation of Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.